Hello everyone and welcome to Lush and Salty Aquariums. My name is Stefan. Thank you for coming to the channel. We're at the 20 gallon Oase Cinescaper. This aquarium features a number of things that I want to talk about today. But well, let's start with something extemporaneous, not the main point. That would be these two uh, glass receptacles that I'm using to grow out a few sprigs of Rotala. Uh, when I make some trimmings from the top of either in this aquarium or another, I can put those uh, little pieces into here and see how they grow up. And then you reuse that plant or not, or bring it to a swap, or try again with something else. Always super fun to experiment and play with horticulture, or I should say aquaculture, when you're uh, so into planted aquariums as I am. You can see from this uh, mid midway shot, the stem plants in the background are mostly still holding their cut. In other words, uh, the haircut I gave them still looks pretty good. I neglected to cut much of the Rotala Atra, that beautiful red, red pink plant there because it grows slower than the pogo stem and octopus, that intense green bunch right there, and certainly slower than the Lemonphilia sessiflora, which is already have a, has a few uh, stems reaching the top. It can grow an inch or more a day, I'm not kidding. But what's fun is if you're doing um, a good light and some CO2, this plant will show uh, some lovely pink red, yellow hues at the top. Uh, but even if you don't have any of those things, a halfway decent light and a halfway decent substrate, you're gonna get growth from that plant. I call it poor man's kabamba. Kabamba is a little bit more challenging and Lemonphilia sessiflora is anything but. Plus it's a legit stem, it's beautiful. A uh, fun fact about this plant, when I gave some to my mother, uh, I set up a nano tank for her which is going pretty good. I'll have to do a video about that. Uh, I just have been respecting her privacy and other issues. I'm not comfortable maybe uh, doing an entire video while she's sitting there knitting and looking at me. <laughs> but I gave her some of this plant and we nicknamed it the Dr. Seuss plant because it has a puff ball every like inch on its stem, sort of like uh, Dr. Seuss's drawings in his uh, famous children's book. So the Dr. Seuss plant is a super fast grower. Pogo stem and octopus uh, is a real fast grower. As soon as it starts uh, bursting out, I mean, it'll overtake anything and everything. It's a great uh, alternative to something like guppy grass. You can see the beautiful tangle in there. And it is a stem plant. But sometimes at the bottom, I mean, it could get uprooted. It won't affect the growth whatsoever. And as fate would have it, this plant is located where the CO2 is discharged right there. So it's definitely getting first crack at uh, that. <laughs> And so I don't anticipate it being very much longer before I'm back in here with the knife, or I should say the scissors. This bronze uh, cryptocorn right here, it could be the bronze Wendetti. I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's so big and cool and fabulous now, and it's definitely done what I wanted it to do, which is give this tank um, a shock of red or, uh, or whatever you want to call that color, maroon, bronze to play off of the uh, brighter red in the background and sort of the transitionary uh, red and yellow use of that piece of dragonstone that I merely uh, put up on its vertical position and stuck it into the substrate to create sort of a Pike's Peak, like a lone mountain. And when the tank was establishing, that was its the main focal point. Now it's just part of a bigger and more robust aquascape. It's kind of fun to see how aquascapes evolve and change in not so long of time, especially with a nice light. That's a uh, Chihiro's RGB Slim. Um, the app on those is pretty terrific. Some people complain about them. I don't know, I set it and forget it, and I don't have to use a timer on this particular aquarium because of 
because of the app and I can control the intensity. It's at about 60%, maybe a little bit less, 100% and God only knows. As it stands, the plants are growing tremendously and I don't wanna to blast too much light on these epiphytes, the Anubias that I'm pointing at now, which look pretty good. And I've got more, this is the Coffeola and the Barteri variety there. And um, down in here is the uh, Anubias Petite. I love how it creates such a thick uh, and lush hedgerow, almost like you'd see at a golf course um, rimming the side, which brings me to one of the features I, I wish to talk about this carpet. Um, this carpet is so luxuriant and full, but it's not a traditional carpet in the sense of how high-end aquascapers like to keep them. For me, it's a bit of a hybrid, but it makes for an intense, terrific lawn effect that's completely healthy for the tank. And I want to talk about that a little bit because the primary plants in here have become a helanthium or dwarf sage or both. Um, those plants are often confused and sold together. And I know I've got both of them in this aquarium. And I know that if you look closely, you can see those sort of micro sword plants. They used to be in the sword plant family. I believe they've been reclassified to helanthium. And so you can see all that. And there's also dwarf hair grass in here because in the beginning, two years ago, like a lot of you, I figured dwarf hair grass, I've got good light and CO2, it's gonna grow great. And it did, but that other stuff that was planted more in the background along with uh, what is now primarily cryptocorn uh, was insidious and it found its way under the, under the substrate and over the top of the structures and just the way Jungle Vale, it just encroached on here. And at first I would pull it out and then, you know, I just started trimming it along with the hair grass. I don't pull little plantlets out or do anything like that. I literally mow the lawn. I take my shears and start at one end and just start clipping all the tops. And I haven't had any issue. And if I'm clipping a few baby cryptocorn that have popped up, and they do all the time. You can see one there. I just trim it right down. And when I get over here to this tiny, not doing so well, um, lily, dwarf uh, tiger lotus, you know, I'll either cut around it or trim those stems off and hope that the bulb down there, which I literally just stuck into the mat, um, will send out new healthier shoots. Here you can see one, a teeny variant of nearite snail. It could be a little horn near right. Um, what's cool about some of the varieties is they don't lay the kind of eggs that the classic ones do, which, you know, leave all those white, uh, very stuck on the thing, white little eggs, and you have to sort of use a razor blade and scratch them off. No big whoop, but that particular variety doesn't do it at all, so uh, better yet, right? So back to this carpet. It has it has uh, hair algae, I ain't gonna lie, I mean, you can see it right there. And I do pull it out with my fingers or a toothbrush, but it's always gonna have some, and it's always gonna have tendrils of Christmas moss that have found it, their way into this carpet. And they start growing and they really enjoy it. And I pull those out, you can see some right back there under the Coriodora. But the thing is, all together, they form a really robust, and uh, consistent mat from left to right. There's no bald spots. There's no change in, I mean, it really is like a grass lawn in the suburbs, but I mean that in the coolest sense of the word, not, you know, the unhealthy way uh, lawns can be, uh, you know, in, in gardening and plant care. It's a different animal, this uh, planted tank syndrome that we have. and a carpet that has certain things that might be considered unhealthy like hair algae or moss uh, encroaching and maybe taking over at times for the hair grass and the helanthium and whatever. There's other plants too. Like I said, the cryptocorn uh, is under there. Its roots are under there. Now you see a dwarf lily. But primarily to keep that intense, fabulous lawn, I just trim and trim and one, you know, off the top, off the top, like mowing the lawn. 
Another thing I do that people do that keep lawns healthy is I take my um, tweezers and I go from left to right and I poke holes in the carpet uh, so that I can better facilitate, you know, the release of the, the exchange, I should say, between the lower part of the aquarium and the upper part of the aquarium. Um, I want to say oxygenate the the um, carpet, but I'm not sure that that's exactly the right way uh, to frame it. That's how you would talk about it outside, you know, in your backyard. Um, but I know it's to to facilitate the exchange of gases. It also allows uh, critters down in there to root around and pull out little pieces of food that fall in there, which they do after every feeding. That's why Coriadoras are so great. They're not scavengers in that they don't eat feces or dead stuff, but they will find every kind of particle of food that will get trapped in your carpet, whatever kind of carpet you're growing. And so you don't want that in there for any long period of time. All right, so what else can we point out here? There's a wonderful little flower that's coming up from some Boucha philandra or bush that's kind of hidden between these crypts. Excited to see that. It's not a rare event, but it is a good sign if you're a uh, boosh and uh, certain other plants in the aquarium, Anubius. You can see a tendril there. I can't tell if that's a new leaf or a potential flower. Either way, I've had that event happen uh, over and over again in this aquarium. And I just love it. I love having underwater flowers it seems like supernatural. In fact, it's quite natural. I've managed to keep the cryptocorns to the left and right, framing what I would often call the amphitheater or the stage, the center stage for these Coriodoras to play on. So you see the cryptocorns back here, and then a little bit bigger bunch here. Now I can. I can control the size ratios, no problem. Um, just to be faithful to this update, I will say I've got um, green neon tetras. Right now they're primarily back in the pogo stem and octopus, but you can see all those wonderful uh, neon colors coming through. I've got a group of Bexford pencil fish. There's a big fat female right in the camera shot there. I've got gold or brass tetras, gold tetras, but they're also called brass tetras. And I've got a group of those as well. Um, there's an autosynclus tootling around. There's some pygmy coriadoras in here. And there's some cherry, ne cherry shrimp, neocaridina. There's a couple there, a beautiful Bloody Mary and a more standard. Bloody Mary is what um, people call these deluxe full red uh, that means all their body parts are red as opposed to the uh, more standard which has some white some striation stripes etc um, is it a marketing gimmick to charge more money for a cherry shrimp i don't know you tell me but um, that shock of red is worth a couple bucks more if you're looking for that effect if you just want the shrimp to do a job then you're, you're, you're wasting your money on a more exotic. But get the cull shrimps, they'll do a great job, they'll breed better, and um, you know, they're, still, they're still very, very cool. And uh, I've got both in my systems. Most of my systems have different forms of neocaridina as well as a mono shrimp. There might be eight to 12 amanos in here. I don't see them right now, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, they're where I want them to be, which is doing the doing the work of this aquarium in all of that aquascape. You want critters, coolyloches, pygmy coriodoras, neo um, neocaridina, caridina, the amano shrimp. You want that in your aquarium if it's a heavily planted system, so that they can get where you can't. I don't want to go messing around in there anyway. There's a Placostomus, a long fin, um, standard Pleco. You can see the orange on his dorsal fin. Not much else from him. I put those in maybe a pair when they were teeny tiny. 
and he's bigger now but he still hasn't outgrown the tank and honestly in the entire time i filmed this video that's the first time we've seen him so i wouldn't be afraid to use a bristle nose in a 20 gallon aquarium um, i wouldn't go smaller with them except if they're very young and you have every intent on moving them when they get too big but in my view they're a pretty non-controversial version of the placostomus in that they don't uproot plants and disturb uh, the other creatures um, they're not that aggressive i haven't had much chasing behavior or any problems from that fish in this tank uh, i suppose if there was a much more bare aquascape a lot of problems would develop for me in terms of that fish and some of the others i certainly wouldn't be able to keep as many fish as i have in here and you know you want more fish have more plants that's one of my biggest uh tips to click right picks to click you want more fish get more plants other than the cichlids that people keep the lake tanganyikans and what have you where you can you have a ton of fish to uh, mitigate aggression but no plants because they will destroy them other than those examples i can't think of a scenario where you wouldn't want to have a heavily planted aquarium if you don't have fish like goldfish or cichlids that will destroy it i hope you enjoyed this little tour if you have any questions or comments by all means hit me up and as always Keep your hands in the tank and ciao for now.